Hello and welcome to this Sounds Like Latin talk and well done for making it this far. If you've been brave enough to press the play button, I, I hope it's because you're vaguely interested in some aspect of Latin or maybe in language generally. Anyway, I hope you enjoy it. Uh, bear with me for a few seconds now while I move across to the left hand side of your screen. I think that's the left hand side, yes, that's the left hand side of your screen. And then you'll be able to see the much more interesting stuff on the right hand side and not have to look at me all the time. Right, let's get going. You may have come across a programme on TV called Flog It. And Flog It is one of these antique type programmes where people bring their junk or antiques in for some expert to value and then they take it to auction and uh, hopefully make lots of money on it. Um, like most of entertainment these days on TV, a lot of it is money based. Anyway, this Flog It programme has been going on for about a thousand uh, editions and I think this year is the last, this year 2020 is the last time it appears. And it's, it's fronted by a chap called um, Paul Martin, that's the name, Paul Martin. He means well, does Paul Martin. But uh, the reason he got me going was that one of the items being sold once was a cap badge belonging to a branch of the army called the, uh, I think it's the army, uh, called the Royal, Royal Corps of Signals. And the Royal of Royal Corps of, Sig Royal Corps of Signals has a cap badge and this cap badge shows the god of uh, messengers, Hermes in Greek, Mercury in Latin, and there you can see his cap badge. And at the bottom of the cap badge, of course, is, is a Latin motto. It's a nice Latin motto. Um, I would translate it as reliable stuff rapidly reliable stuff rapidly so it's a good it's a good motto for if you're sending signals to um, your fellow soldiers but what annoyed me was uh, Paul Martin's pronunciation of this Latin motto which I would pronounce Kerta Kito or Kerta Kito to be more precise so he says ah oh, and he's even got a Latin motto at the bottom Certicito Certicito my goodness, Serta Saito. And that brought it home for me, I think, a fairly common, common trait. Uh, there's a, an assumption among those who don't know any Latin that because the Latin alphabet was more or less the same as the one we use today, you can pronounce it more or less any, any way you like, Serta Saito. Uh, whereas I hope some of you will know that in Latin, C, is never pronounced like an S. Uh, so the word for 100 isn't centum but kentum. And the letter I, as in kitor, is never pronounced I. So certicito, uh, the current Mrs. Bass got really annoyed when I started throwing things at the TV and hurling abuse. She said, calm down, it's only Latin, it's only Latin. So I I started looking at how Latin, or I started looking at some time ago, the correct way to pronounce Latin. And there is a correct way to pronounce Latin and a wrong way to, to pronounce Latin. A favourite red herring in class is, so how do we know how do we know how Latin was pronounced? You know, they didn't have tape recorders or MP3 players or whatever the technology is back then. How do we know? There are loads of ways. There are loads of ways. And um, the standard work on this is a, a book called Vox Latina. It's the standard work on Latin pronunciation, uh, written by a scholar, an amazing scholar, called uh, Sidney Allen from Cambridge. And I've got it on my, my shelf here, actually. Um, it's a thin volume. It's a thin volume. Only 133 pages. But my goodness, it is packed through of scholarship 
packed through with scholarship. And he, he investigates all Latin sounds and the ancient grammarians' accounts of these sounds. And he puts all other clues together as well. And he comes up with seven reasons why we know how Latin it, it was pronounced as it was. And uh, his, the best bit, of course, the easiest bit, is the summary at the back of the book, where he summarises how you pronounce these different sounds. Um, and he quotes all these um, ancient grammarians and in Latin and Greek without any English translation, because you're assumed to uh, <laughs> to be up to speed with that. So it's an amazing it's an amazing book. And uh, he's done a companion volume called Vox Graeca, Vox Graeca, as well on how ancient Greek was pronounced. Uh, so we're going to look at a bit of this uh, now, and I'm going to start with a Felixstowe market. Felixstowe used to have a market on a Sunday morning and all, all life would be at Felixstowe market. And um, we've had some happy mornings. It's, it's made way for a modern development now, which isn't, ha hasn't opened yet, but um, it'll come. Anyway, Felixstowe market, and you get people shouting out. And the interesting thing is at Felixstowe market, at the fruit and veg store like this one, is you don't get the tradesman saying, Oi, get your apples here, get your apples here. He says, get your Cox's Pippins here. Get your Granny Smith's here. Not get your apples here. And th that vaguely takes me to where, to where we're going. Uh, these are figs. These are figs. <laughs> but not just any figs. They're figs which were imported to... The Roman, the Roman world, the Roman Empire, from a city in Asia Minor, what we'd now call Turkey, and this city is called Kaunas. Kaunas. So these were Kaunian figs. And in Latin, you sell things in the accusative case, the object, the receiver case. So Kaunian figs, get your Kaunian figs here, would be in Latin, Calneas, Calneas, get your cornean fix here. Now, this chap, this good looking chap, was the sort of um, oligarch, one of the oligarchs of the late Roman Republic in the first century BC. His name was Marcus Licinius Crassus, and he was, he was absolutely dripping rich. And one day, in uh, I think it was 55 BC, some mid 50s BC, he was on the east coast Italian port of Brundisium, Brindisi in modern parlance, and Brundisium. He was about to embark on a campaign in the Middle East. He was setting sail with his fleet and army from the port of Brundisium to Syria. Uh, Brundisium was a sort of Dover the Dover-Calais route across to Greece from the east coast of Italy was Brundisium. And as he left his home, he came across in the street outside, just before he was leaving, um, a seller of figs, a market stall filler. And the fig, the fig seller was saying, Kaunas, Kaunas. And the story goes that he misheard this, or he should have misheard it, as Kaunas, which is the Latin for beware, beware of going, beware of going, don't go. So some people took this as a warning that he shouldn't go on this expedition to the Middle East in Sicily. And the, the, from the point of view of the pronunciation, of course, the Kaunas, Kaunas, is evidence that the V in Latin isn't pronounced as a V in English more like a W. And the passage we've got here is from Cicero, from his work De Divinatione, on divination, uh, talking about um, omens and fortune telling, that sort of thing. And the, the passage here says that uh, when Crassus was embarking his army at Brundisium, someone selling um, 
figs imported from Kaunas were kept on shouting, Kaunas, Kaunas. And he says that this was a warning. And he goes on to say in the second part of that, if you like, if we accept that Crassus was being warned to beware of going and that he wouldn't have perished because he perished on this expedition in Syria, he never came back that he wouldn't have perished if he had obeyed the omen. If we accept that, then we have to accept that if we knock our foot or break a shoelace or sneeze, that counts as significant omens as well. So that's, that's the evidence for pronouncing, uh, one of the bits of evidence of pronouncing a, a V in Latin, not as a V in English. Now this is a passage from Cassius Dio, sometimes called Cassio, <laughs> Dio Cassius. Uh, he was an interesting historian. He was high up in Roman government. He held the highest office in Rome and was, had access to all government uh, paperwork and, and important stuff. And in the uh, mid second to mid third century BC, he wrote a history of Rome from its beginnings in 80 books or 80 papyrus rolls. And um, the interesting thing is he wrote his history in Greek. Although he's a member of the Roman government, he wrote his history in Greek. So this is very interesting on how he deals with Greek names or Roman names as they appear in Greek. And this is the beginning of book 65 of his work and he he opens uh, a lot of his books with who was in office at this time of of roman history which is a good archive evidence he had he must have had access to all the official archives and if you look uh there you can make out there uh the word uespasianos uespasianos and this is clearly a reference to the Emperor Vespasian, which in Latin looks like Vespasianus. And it's because it's Uespasianos in Greek, that gives us more evidence that the V in Latin was pronounced more like an English W, an English W. And here's this famous phrase, you may have heard Julius Caesar a quote of Julius Caesar. Weeny weedy weeky. I came, I saw, I conquered. Nothing to do with Roman Britain. It's when he was he was campaigning through the Middle East and beating up all the natives and everyone was throwing themselves, wanted to surrender their cities immediately because they knew that if they didn't surrender and put him to the trouble of conducting a siege and capturing this, they knew that they were in for a pretty bad time. So weeny weedy weeky is was Caesar's quote. And uh, the, the most amusing translation I've come across for that is a piece of cake, a piece of cake. <laughs> They're just throwing their doors open to me. I don't have to go into siege tactics or anything like that. Weeny weedy weeky. Going back to that piece of Dio again, there's another interesting uh, word there. Uh, a piece of Latin transliterated into his Greek. And that's the word Caesares, Caesares. The Caesars, the Caesars. And uh, because it's Caesares, of course, uh, that gives us evidence for the initial C of Latin, Caesars, not being pronounced as a, an S. Rather like good old Paul Martin in that uh, Flog It program, Certa Cito, he said, Certa Cito, when he should have been Certa Kito. Uh, so there's evidence that this chap, Cicero is his traditional English name, was actually pronounced in ancient times as Cicerone, Cicerone, or Cicero. It's actually Latin for a chickpea, a chickpea. So it's these sort of clues that enable us to find out what Latin actually sounded like. And uh, look at this place, look at this place, marvellous the Library of Celsus at Ephesus in Turkey. Library of Celsus. One of the three great libraries of the ancient world after Alexandria and Pergamum. Marvellous building. 
And the reason I've mentioned li I, I go into libraries because we associate libraries in modern times with being places of quiet and hush. But in fact, libraries in ancient times would have been noisy places uh, because um, the Romans were seemed to be incapable of reading in silence like we do today. We take reading in silence for granted. The Romans couldn't read in silence and it's no coincidence, as you can see here, that the Greek for I say, ligo, ligo, is the same as the Latin for I read, lego. So saying and reading were the same thing, which is why Latin was a language to be said aloud. And we've got some clues about this as well. There are two famous clues. One's uh, in a first century writer called Horace who wrote some satires. And he draws a distinction here between someone reading or being silent. So obviously reading meant making a sound, making a sound. And the other more famous clue, if you fast forward about um, 500 years, um, involves these two gents. Uh, St Ambrose on the left, a famous churchman of the 5th century, uh, Bishop of Milan in I think 376 AD, and his younger protégé on the right was St Augustine, the famous St Augustine. And um, apparently, I'm, I'm not an expert on this, but Ambrose had a great influence on St Augustine. And one day, Augustine uh, popped in to see him and found Ambrose reading. And something very strange struck him about his reading. And that was that he wasn't making any noise. And he, he, here's the evidence for this. Uh, it's from a, a book called Augustine's Confessions, 384 AD. And the, the Latin says, whenever he would read, his eyes would be led across the pages and his heart would rummage about for the meaning. But his, and here's the clue, here's the, the key bit, his voice and his tongue were still. His voice and his tongue were still. This is how we saw him reading, quietly and never in any other way. So, in the late 4th century, it was unusual for someone to be reading in silence. Now, a great way of reconstructing the sounds of a language is by how it's misspelt. Kilroy wasia and other graffiti, okay? Wasia may not be good English, but it's a very good indication of the sounds of the English. And we, came, we come across the same thing in Latin. Uh, if you look at some of the inscriptions, some of the um, graffiti of Pompeii, we see things like in parque, where it should be in parque, in peace, or in the bath, in balneo, instead of in balneo. It's easier to, it's easier to say. The, the tongue and the mouth are lazy organs of pronunciation. We tend to say things as easily as we can. And ignes, the word for fires, ignes, ignes, English word ignite, of course. So these um, mis, misspellings are really useful in um, piecing together how ancient Latin was pronounced. And uh, on that subject, this tatty piece of papyrus, water-damaged papyrus, was discovered in about the 7th or 8th century AD and is called the Appendix Probi. Sounds a bit distasteful. Pro Probus's um, appendix. <laughs> uh, 
Probus was a grammarian in the first century, in, in the reign of Nero, so that's about 54 to 68 AD. And he wrote commentaries on, on Latin authors. And a couple of centuries later, 4th or 5th century we think, um, someone wrote this additional bit on some of the stuff he put. And whoever wrote this was obviously being annoyed by the way people were pronouncing their Latin at that stage of the language. Um, we all do this. We have pet hates. Um, we wish things weren't pronounced the way they were. And uh, people like me, geeks like us, uh, um, are... Are, are guilty of this. He, here are some of the things I can't stand at the moment. Um, people saying, sh people writing um, should of when they should be saying should have. Uh, I've actually seen a youngster write our father when it should be our father, of course. Fewer and less is a, an old favourite. You can uh, find out later if you're, if you're puzzled about this. And you'll be amazed at how many people, when they say cannot, when they mean cannot overestimate. No, when they mean cannot, yes, when they mean cannot overestimate to say how marvellous something is, they say instead cannot underestimate, which is exactly the opposite of what they mean. A brief acronym is a, a trendy word these days, but not many people use it correctly. It's not the same as an abbreviation. Look up acronyms sometime. And between you and me is correct. Between you and I is wrong. And there are loads of others that um, people like me can go on about and your teacher will go, go your teachers will go on about and, and and literate adults go on about as well. And this is a, the form that whoever wrote Probus's appendix, this is the form that he put his comments in. It should be this, not that. So that gives a good indication of what in pro uh, the pronunciation of Latin in about the third or fourth century was getting on his nerves. And it's very handy to compare these with the way modern European languages are developing from Latin. And here are some examples from Probus's appendix. Uh, Pridem is the Latin word for the day before. Nasals, by the way, are m or n sounds, m and n. So, whereas uh, someone studying Latin like we do at school of the first and centuries BC and AD would say pridem, by the third and fourth century, people were dropping that final m and numquam instead, instead of people saying numqua. I think numca is Spanish for never. It's lost the M. Passim, the word for everywhere. People were annoying whoever wrote this by saying passi. Olim, once upon a time. Idem, the same, the same. English word identical, that sort of thing. And the last one is particularly interesting. Ma the word for table, mensa. You talk about the officer's mess in the army. Where, where they eat is the table, the mensa in Latin, but even in the 4th century, people were saying mesa, they're, they're being lazy, they're being lazy. And uh, the reason that particularly is, that, that N is particularly interesting, um, for a number of reasons. Uh, if you know this building, you'll recognise it as a pantheon, uh, temple to all the gods in theory, in, in Rome. Lovely building. And uh, particularly interesting linguistically for the inscription that's on, on the top here. Uh, you can just see the, the ending of the word Agrippa, uh, Augustus's henchman on the left. LF, uh, Lucii Filius, the son of Lucius. Cos ter. This means when he was consul for the third time. Consul is sort of joint prime minister, the, the ultimate uh, head of the government ladder. Uh, 
uh, at this time. So when he was consul for the third time, uh, that dates the original to, twenty, I think, 27 BC. But the actual modern pantheon is, is more recent than that. But the interesting is that the abbreviation for consul, consul, in Latin, consul, C-O-N-S, is cos, cos. So you've got, you've got the disappearing N there in the middle of a word. So that has repercussions in modern languages, uh, particularly in, in Latin. Apart from cos and mes, I'll give cos and mes, you've got the, the word for um, spouse, wife, sposa, and uh, isola in Italian, where they've come from Latin and that N has disappeared. Now, here's, here's a word which will be close to your heart. Now, I don't know how you pronounce this, but I pronounce it chocolate. I love Cadbury's chocolate and chocolate Easter eggs. Chocolate Easter eggs. Notice that you don't pronounce the middle syllable. You, I've heard no one say chocolate, chocolate. And in the same way, medicine and lovely. This, this is called unstressed syllables after a stressed one disappear. So chocolate, the first syllable is stressed so much that the short syllable coming after it disappears. Chocolate. No one says chocolate, chocolate, chocolate. This is happening at the moment to medicine. Medicine. Some people say medicine. I tried this out at a conference last year. And I think everyone has agreed on chocolate. But some of the delegates there clearly still pronounced medicine. Medicine. He is a doctor of medicine. And lovely. Lovely is going the same way. The first syllable of medicine is so strong that the I is dropping out. And the first syllable of lovely is so strongly stressed that the E is left out as well. So that's disappearing. And the same things happened in Latin. A stressed syllable followed by especially a, sh a short unstressed syllable, that unstressed syllable falls out. So the word for mirror, going back to Probus's appendix again, what was annoying, whoever the author was, uh, was drawing attention to the fact that these unstressed syllables are disappearing. Speculum, not speculum. Articulus, not articulus. English word article, which just means a little joint. Angulus, corner. Calida, not calda. Here we see again the French and Italian uh, languages, the early stages of show in French and caldo in Italian and foie in French, frigidus, refrigerator, and viridis, viridis, the origin of, um, well, verdant is the nice English adjective for greenery, and vert, of course, in French for green. In fact, if you wanted to make up a verb for I am green and caring for the environment and a fan of recycling, if you're making up a word for green, to be green, you could do a lot worse than what this company have done and name themselves Veridor, Veridor. Other things noticed in Probus's appendix is the confusion between B and V. B and V. So the word for commoners, plebes, uh, was in, in his time, whoever he is, whoever he was, was being pronounced as plevis, plevis. And, and this too has come through to modern languages. Mirabilia, amazing things, marvellous things, gives you these words, a merveille in, in French and maravilla and maravilla in Spanish, where you've got that B turning into a V for some reason. So there's all sorts of ways you can uh, trace back how Latin was pronounced.
but it's the sounds of Latin which always have always attracted me um, ever since I first met Latin poetry in about 1968 when I was introduced to um, what most people would call the greatest Latin poet Virgil. This line is a favourite um, line of mine. It's from Statius, a writer of later epic and he wrote a, an epic poem on the Th Th Thebaid, very heavily influenced by Virgil. And this line of poetry uh, describe, is, it's a part of an epic simile where a soldier has run amok on the battlefield, killing everyone before him, and then sated with um, slaughter, he sits down and recovers from all the bloodshed. And he's covered with blood and gore and guts. And he's compared to a lion who's let loose in a sheep pen and has gone mad in the sheep pen, slaughtering, slaughtering the animals and licking, licking his fur cleaning the blood off his fur after all, after all the bloodshed. And it's a lovely line of Latin. Mollia que as a lion, Ut Leo introduces the simile. As a lion does all this. And the, the lovely line is, Mollia que yecta de lambit vellera lingua. Mollia que yecta de lambit vellera lingua and those the alliteration of those l's molia de lambit vellera lingua it actually makes your tongue imitate the lion licking his fur licking his fur the latin means uh, he sticks out his tongue and licks off his soft fur he sticks out his tongue, a yecta lingua, and he licks off the soft fur. Mollia que yecta de lambit vellera lingua. There's a lot going on in this line of Latin. People say, oh, Latin poetry, just read it in translation. I heard someone once define poetry as what gets lost in translation. And it's never the same thing. There's a lot going on in this line of Latin. Uh, look at this. You've got the verb in the middle and symmetrically around it. You've got an adjective at the beginning, pick, picked up by the noun later on. And you've got ad the second adjective, picking up a yectar lingua, sticking out his tongue at the end. And it's all symmetrically arranged about that verb in the middle. And quite apart from the sound and the alliteration and the imitative gestures of your tongue, mollia que yecta de lambit vellera lingua. If you can convey that in English translation to me, you're a better man than I am, that's for sure. And another example of that sort of thing. You may have seen this statue. It's the famous Capitoline wolf. It shows Romulus and Remus being suckled, it's a famous story, being suckled by a she-wolf in the wild. And it's not the only instance of young children being suckled by wild animals. Uh, in the second half of Virgil's Aeneid, there's a chap called Metabus. Uh, here he is. Metabus is running away from some bad guys and is carrying with him his baby daughter Camilla and he comes to a river and he's being pursued by the bad guys the Volscians I think they were the tribe and to save his baby he ties her to a spear and throws the spear across the river and then swims across and retrieves his daughter Camilla and they spend weeks in the wilderness living in the forests and there again he 
um, feeds his daughter by by getting her to suck at the teats of of wild animals. Here in the forest, heek, natam, lacte farino nutri, nutribat. Here he used to nourish, rear his daughter, lacte farino, on the milk of wild beasts. Teneris mulgins ubera labris. Milking in their udders, their teats, onto her tender lips. So he's forcing the baby, his baby, with its tender lips, to suck on the teats of these wild animals. But, but read that line aloud. Nutribat teneris emulgens ubera labris. Emulgens ubera. Emulgens ubera. Your mouth is being forced to make the same gestures, the same movements as a young baby sucking on his mother's teats. Emulgens ubera. It's amazing poetry. And if you don't know how the Latin sounds, you'll never be able to appreciate it. That's why people and geeks like me love the sounds of Latin. Thanks for your attention, if you got this far. Bye for now.